Welcome to module number nine, Managing Calves Organically. My name is Cindy Daly. I'll be your instructor for this module. I manage an organic dairy at the University Farm in Chico, California, together with my staff and student management team. We've learned a great deal over the course of the last six years that we've been managing this herd organically, learning not only from our own personal first-hand accounts, but also from the number of farms that we have visited across the country. Our goal for this module is to impress upon you the importance of calf rearing. Raising that next generation of replacements is a critical area that's often ignored on a very busy dairy that tends to be focused on milking, feeding, and breeding of the lactating herd. Calf rearing methods vary greatly throughout the industry, and they certainly have a tremendous impact on the future of the cow herd. Calf management takes special time and attention and it really should be placed in the hands of someone who's dedicated to the health and well-being of the future of the herd. When it's done well, it's an art form. What we plan to cover in this module is the effects of dry cow management on calf growth and calf well-being. We'll talk about feeding the newborn, nutrition, normal mortality and morbidity rates. We'll cover calf housing and its effects on calf health. We'll talk about dehorning methods, when it should be done, common calf issues, vaccination programs, and then we'll finish with a discussion on how to go about weaning these calves. Here are the required readings and videos for Module 9. Make sure you read and watch all this material prior to taking the quiz at the conclusion of the lesson. Calf care, whether it's organic or conventional, begins in the dry cow as she prepares for parturition and that subsequent lactation cycle. Newborn calf morbidity and mortality rates can usually be tied to poor nutrition in the cow as she moves into her late lactation and her dry off period. The last 90 days of the cow's lactation are really critical to set the stage for the next lactation and for getting that calf started off right. This concept is even more crucial for the organic dairy producer who has fewer treatment options for those sick calves. Prevention is key. An easy method for monitoring the success of a dairy's nutritional program is to track the cow's body condition throughout the lactation. A body condition score can be assigned based on a visual assessment of five key areas on the cow. The scoring system defines the full range of body conditions, with one being excessively thin, and five, being absolutely obese. Cows that transition into their dry cycle with optimal body condition scores, usually around a 3-5 on a 5.0 scale, have significantly lower incidences of calf morbidity and mortality. For more information on the nutritional requirements of the lactating dairy cow and body condition scoring in general, see module number four. At the time of calving, maternity housing needs to be a very clean environment. Cows should calve on fresh pasture if at all possible, or in a nice clean, dry, well-bedded maternity pen with adequate space to move freely about throughout the entire process of, of calving. It's important that the cow be able to lick the calf after calving. It's an easy way to get that calf clean and dry while stimulating the calf's respiratory and circulatory system. And you also improve the calves' ability to absorb nutrients across the intestinal tract. At the time of calving, it's a common practice to dip the navel in a 7% iodine solution. You need to dip the area completely up and around the navel entry to get a complete contact kill. The cord represents a patent doorway into the abdominal cavity, and it's a potential source for bacterial infections such as navel ill and joint ill. Another common practice at the time of birth is to administer an intranasal vaccine for respiratory. This is done just to reduce the incidence of, of early pneumonia in these baby calves. To nurse or not to nurse, it is a huge question within our industry. There are a number of opinions with respect to allowing calves to nurse that cow during the first 24 hour period um, for the purposes of, of colostral intake. The greater preponderance of recommendations from the conventional world would suggest that nursing is just a very bad idea, particularly when sanitation is not carefully controlled in the maternity area. 
To allow that calf to nurse the cow is in less than sanitary conditions invites problems including a much greater risk of disease transmission. For example, Cryptosporidium, a common microscopic parasite, can be transmitted to the calf from a contaminated udder. It's a fairly common mode of infection for that particular organism in newborns. Crypto causes severe diarrhea and is highly infective. Calves infected with crypto should be isolated and treated with copious amounts of fluids containing electrolytes. In addition to the potential for infection, colostrum intake is really critical during that first 24-hour period of the calf's life just to ensure that that newborn receives adequate passive immunization in the form of immunoglobulins, or IgG. <clears throat> Without that, the calf is severely compromised. And it's been shown statistically that you know, less than 40% of the calves that consume, can consume adequate amounts of colostrum via direct nursing, primarily due to the fact that these calves can often be weak at birth, there may be poor udder conformation, or a variety of other obstructions to the calves' ability to get up and nurse, particularly in that first 24-hour period. And it's really critical that the calf does receive adequate amounts of colostrum in the first 24 hours. So let's talk a little bit about IgG and passive immunization. As we've already said, colostrum intake is really critical during that first 24-hour period of the calf's life to ensure that that, that newborn receives adequate passive immunity in the form of immunoglobulins known as antibodies. The calf is born without any IgG due to the fact that these rather large proteins simply don't pass through the placenta into the fetal blood supply when the calf is in the womb. So the only way a calf becomes protected against disease is through passive process of conferring IgG, or these antibodies, through the colostrum. What's more, the calf's ability to absorb these large proteins through the gut wall drops precipitously during that first 24-hour period. So it's absolutely critical that the calf receive an adequate supply during the first few hours of life. If the calf doesn't receive enough high-quality colostrum within that critical 24-hour window just after birth to confer a passive immunization, it will be more susceptible to disease. You will have more problems. Estimates would suggest that only about 20 to 40 percent of all calves allowed to nurse the cow post-calving will consume enough colostrum in the first 24 hours of life to be protected adequately with with the amount of IgG in the bloodstream that's needed to, to achieve this passive immunization. Traditionally, it's recommended that a calf will receive or should receive two quarts of colostrum within the first 12 hours after birth, and then another two quarts 12 hours later. For practical purposes, let's call this the 2 plus 2 feeding program. Dairy practitioners recommend 10 grams of IgG per liter of serum for an average calf at 24 hours of age to be protected against disease. To achieve that level of protection, the average calf would need to consume at least two quarts of high quality colostrum, colostrum that uh, contains 50 grams per liter of IgG. Producers need to be aware that not all colostrum is high quality colostrum and that calves vary in their ability to absorb the proteins. So the two plus two approach allows for that fudge factor that's needed and it is the best approach for getting all your calves started off right. Once in the system, IgG will protect that calf for about three to four weeks, while the newborn begins the process of acquiring his or her own immunity, and that's just a matter of time. There are tremendous differences in colostrum quality. Typically, the older, more mature cows produce more IgG per liter of colostrum than, than a first calf heifer. Measuring the amount of IgG in colostrum can be accomplished with a simple device called a clostrometer. If the clostrometer is not available, Washington State University established some correlations between colostrum quality and volume. As the volume or the amount of colostrum produced per milking goes up, Washington State reported a drop in the overall concentration of IgG per liter. So these researchers would suggest that producers use the 18-pound rule. If the cow gives more than 18 pounds of colostrum in a milking, it will likely contain less than 35 grams of IgG per liter. 
which is well below the concentration of IgG that's needed to confer passive immunity to a newborn calf with that 2 plus 2 colostrum feeding regime. So in the end, feed all newborns a minimum of 2 quarts of high quality colostrum and uh, between the first and 12 hours after birth and then another 2 quarts within the next 12 hours to set the stage for truly healthy calves. One of the big questions in the industry is whether or not yonis can be transmitted through colostrum. Mycobacterium paratuberculosis is the organism and pasteurization is effective in killing that organism in milk. However, it does not kill yonis in colostrum and that's primarily due to the fact that the colostrum's vis viscosity will protect the organism from the heat. Colostrum is one mechanism of transmission. 22% of all Yoni's cows will shed into their milk and it is in fact a source of transmission into your calves. So it's highly recommended that you only feed colostrum to calves from Yoni's negative cows. So test all your cows, identify the positives, cull them from the herd and only use the negative cow colostrum to feed your calves. One way to ensure that you have enough colostrum on hand from Yoni's negative cows is to bank that colostrum. You can freeze colostrum pretty effectively. Place the colostrum in a one gallon plastic bag or a plastic container. Lay flat in the freezer with wax paper in between and label it, obviously. Put a date and um, the cow identification number on each container. When it's time, you can thaw the colostrum slowly in water. Never, never do it in the microwave. It will destroy the essential proteins that are needed for the passive immunization. Stir before you feed it and feed it in a very sanitized bottle so that you're not transmitting other bad diseases um, in the process. Calves between 1 and 21 days of age are designed to utilize milk as their primary nutritional source, owing in part to the fact that you know, only one compartment of their stomach is actually functional at this age. That would be the abomasum. The other three compartments of the stomach, including the reticulum, the rumen, and the omasum, are only stimulated to develop and function when a fibrous material is consumed, like grass or hay. There are a number of opinions on whether or when it's appropriate to introduce hay and grain into the diet of young calves. It's been our practice to provide access to high quality alfalfa and a little sweet grain between two and four weeks of age, just to begin that process of transition from milk to supplemental feeds and grass. Regardless of the timing of the introduced supplemental feeds, all calves should be fed adequate amounts of whole milk for a minimum of two months with a full three months really being preferred by many of the most successful calf raisers I've known. Of course, this will drive up the cost of raising replacement heifers if hospital milk is not available. Calf milk taken from the bulk tank will cost roughly 28 cents per gallon or 56 cents per calf per day, in addition to any of the additional supplemental feeds that you happen to be feeding. According to the National Research Council, or the NRC, Calves should be fed to gain between one and one and a half pounds per day to achieve adequate body size for breeding at 14 to 16 months of age. Organically managed calves are no exception and should be fed to gain at very similar rates. Whole milk supplies ample protein and energy for calves if one to two pounds of milk are fed for every 10 to 12 pounds of body weight. If hospital milk is to be fed to calves, it's important that it's effectively pasteurized, which is 145 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes, or 161 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds. That would be equivalent to an HTST system. Heating results in a reduction in the concentration of viable bacteria. The rate of heat inactivation of bacteria increases exponentially with the amount of time the milk is exposed to the pasteurization temperatures. Make sure that the batch pasteurizer is equipped with an agitator to allow for even heating of the milk. Otherwise, bacteria may survive and it really defeats the purpose. Studies have shown that pasteurization can eliminate pathogenic strains of Staphylococcus, Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria, 
Mycobacterium paratuberculosis, and most mycoplasma species. There are also reports that feeding pasteurized hospital milk also results in calves having less scours and pneumonia as compared to calves that are fed non-pasteurized hospital milk. So this would be a, a typical system that would be put into play at the time of calving. Calves would be um, a pulled from their mother after the mother has had the opportunity to completely lick it off and dry it down. The calves would be placed into a hutch at birth to basically thermoregulate in a, in a nice deep bedding pack that's clean and dry and warm. We would apply the 2 plus 2 colostrum feeding regime and get two quarts of really high col quality colostrum into that calf within the first 12 hours and then two more quarts in um, within 24 hours. So the calf would have consumed four quarts of high quality colostrum within its first day of life. In addition, as that calf is moved into the hutch, it would also be treated with a, a iodine solution, a 7% iodine solution on the navel to completely disinfect that doorway into the abdominal cavity. In our program, at a week of age, calves are moved into group pens and then they're fed by group feeders according to their age. Milk allowances are increased over the course of the next eight weeks to a volume of two gallons, which is split between two feedings per day. It's important to increase the milk slowly to avoid digestive upset and scours. In order that calves grow optimally, we provide supplemental calf grain with a, about a 16% protein pellet. And we also provide some alfalfa hay, and that usually starts between two and three weeks of age. The figure to the right shows that energy requirements for the average daily gain of calves, the ratio of metabolizable energy to average daily gain fluctuates by breed and by weather. So the larger the calves, like Holsteins, they require more metabolizable energy, or kilocals per day, than the smaller breeds like Jerseys. Temperature extremes also alter the metabolizable energy requirements to maintain a, a specific average daily gain in these young growing calves, which means that they're just going to need more feed during that cooler weather period for adequate gain. Let's move on to weaning. At two and a half months of age, or 10 weeks, we begin the weaning process where calves are then fed a gallon of milk a day, shifting their dependence from milk to grazing hay and grain. Now depending upon the transition and the amount of milk we might have available, calves are typically weaned at about 12 weeks of age in our program. So at that point they're consuming roughly three pounds of calf grain or calf starter and they're broke to the calf stanchion where they can feed on hay and silage. The goal is, is really a seamless transition from milk to a forage-based diet. When to wean is another hotly debated topic within the industry. The primary criterion that should be considered before weaning can occur is, is adequate rumen development. That is, the rumen must be capable of rumen fermentation. If calves are on two to three pounds of grain per day, eating some dry hay, grazing some grass or pasture forages, and if they are in excellent body condition, then it sounds like they're ready to wean. According to nutritionists, Calves consuming 1.3 to 1.5 percent of their body weight as dry feed will have adequate intake for weaning. The large breed calves, this would translate to 2 to 3 pounds of calf starter per day. For Jersey calves, it's estimated that 1.5 pounds of calf starter per day is needed at the time of weaning. So regardless, <clears throat> weaning is a stress on the calves and it really needs to be monitored quite carefully. Remember that maintenance requirements for calves will increase about 1% for each 1 degree drop in ambient temperature. So an increase in grain or calf starter supplementation is really needed during cold weather snaps. Don't dehorn or vaccinate at the time of weaning. This will only compound the stressors and cause more disease outbreaks. In fact, all calf processing and calf vaccinations should be completed well in advance, several weeks of weaning, to ensure that the calf is adequately protected. Here is a routine preventative health care practice regime for calf management that's put forward by Cornell University. 
They recommend that all calves at birth will have their navels dipped in, in iodine, as we've already discussed, and they will also have an ear tag administered at that time for animal identification purposes. They recommend dehorning and extra teat removal by three months of age. We recommend that that happens prior to one month of age. Cornell would suggest that vaccinations occur between four and six months of age and then again at breeding time. The type of vaccinations that are recommended are IBR, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, BVD, bovine viral diarrhea, type 1 and type 2, BRSV, which is bovine respiratory syncytial virus, pink eye or Moraxella bovis, leptospirosis, and then of course brucellosis, which is uh, the Bangs vaccine, which should occur between 4 and 8 months of age. And Cornell always recommends that you check the ventilation in your calf housing system. For those of us that pasture or group house out on pasture, ventilation is not an issue. But if you do have an enclosed calving system and you have a high incidence of pneumonia, it's an indication that you may have some ventilation issues that you need to address. Let's move on to calf housing. According to the USDA, 75% of dairy operations in the United States house calves individually prior to weaning. Calf hutches or calf huts are extremely popular. Even so, group housing is on the rise in some countries because it's believed to be a little more animal friendly. Cattle are social animals and have some basic fundamental needs for socialization. So the primary purpose for individual housing prior to weaning is to limit the spread of disease. There is some evidence that the prevalence of some diarrhea diseases like cryptosporidium, coccidia, rotavirus is lower when calves are housed in hutches as compared to group pens and that the group housing of calves before weaning may actually increase the odds of calves shedding E. coli, the 0157H7 virulent form. In addition, Respiratory disease outbreaks within group housed calves can also be problematic. It really depends though on the overall management. Another style of calf feeding is called the nurse cow method. It's growing in popularity. You basically graft several calves onto a lactating cow. The calves do very, very well. They're able to nurse in a more natural type pattern. The labor is fairly high initially to get the calves grafted onto the cow and then it actually reduces your calf feeding labor because the cow takes over that chore. So there are some real benefits to this system. Oftentimes producers will take a cow who is high somatic cell who you can't necessarily put into the bulk tank um, anyway and as long as she's gentle and doesn't kick um, then she can be turned into a nurse cow. Calf housing in group pens is uh, on the rise. It is a, the preferred method among animal welfare concerns because the calves are allowed to interact with one another. The ideal pen size is between six and nine. You really don't want to get over that number in each pen. The advantages, it's easier to bed. It's easier to clean. Um, calves are easier to feed this way. So it does have labor savings uh, to it in a significant way. However, there is a higher risk of disease transmission and a higher incidence of cross-sucking um, among calves, so that you do end up with a, a few more damaged udders. All of these things can, of course, be managed, but they, they do indeed need to have someone who is observant um, and on the ball to make sure that they can circumvent any of the problems as they arise. Group feeding calves does take a little time and finesse. You need to train these calves to drink from these large nipple feeders. Um, it usually takes about three days and the calves need to be very aggressive drinkers. The calf care givers need to be watching these groups of calves very closely for any sickness or weakness or slow drinkers and they should be removed and isolated um, so that they can better compete in another situation. We also leave the nipple feeder in the calf barn with water. Um, it cleans out the nipples and it also deters calves from sucking on each other after the milk is all gone. Another style of feeding calves is called the New Zealand mob style calf rearing methods. 
This is a picture of Meredith Burroughs. She's with California Cloverleaf Farms in Denier, California. Meredith and her husband, Zeb, have been raising calves using the New Zealand style of calf rearing for um, several years now. And they have designed a very low-cost feeder. Uh, they, they basically have, have modified a food-grade 55-gallon drum, installed the peach teats or the McCarville nipple. Uh, you can get those from McCarville Dairy Supply. And then they hook the, each nipple up to a plastic line, which, you know, is, is good for one season. And then all of those <clears throat> components are switched out for the following year. The position of the nipples are very important on this barrel to kind of get that correct head position for nursing. Saliva production is very important, and saliva contains the buffering agents that aid in the digestion of the milk. And all of that has to do with sucking and head position. So it's an important component to be considered. Producers may want to use the average calf morbidity and calf mortality rates as an objective indicator or barometer, if you will, of adequate housing and overall calf management. Data from Europe and the United States show an average pre-weaning dairy calf mortality rate of about 7.8 percent. Likewise, the, the National Dairy Heifer Evaluation Project, conducted by the USDA, reports a 6.3 percent average mortality rate among pre-weaned heifers to eight weeks of age in the U.S. Moreover, the National morbidity rate or incidence of sickness vary greatly by region and by dairy as you might expect. Scours and pneumonia are the leading cause of illness in pre-weaned calves in the U.S. with a 27% morbidity rate for scours and an 8.9% morbidity rate to pneumonia. So these aren't necessarily targets for good practice. They are windows into what is normal with respect to health statistics, and they directly reflect management. So if you can operate well below those statistics, then you know that your management is on the right track. Ventilation in your calf housing system is really critical. If pneumonia persists in your program, it may be time to consider housing ventilation as a potential issue. While these enclosed housing systems do protect calves from cold and wet, they also create air quality issues if your ventilation or airflow isn't adequate. So no matter what housing system is used, it's really important that the air used for ventilation is clean and fresh. Newborn calf housing is best located on the windward side of the farm to minimize the passage of airborne pathogens from the older animals. Airborne pathogens like mycoplasma can be carried by air currents several hundred yards, pointing to the critical nature of placement of the calf housing relative to the rest of the dairy layout. Given that there is clean air outside the housing structure, a goal is to have air quality within the microenvironment that surrounds the calf to be very similar to the outside air. With proper ventilation, the relative humidity will be nearly the same in the calf zone as it is outside, and that the concentration of manure gases, dust, and pathogens will be very low. Improper ventilation can cause serious respiratory problems, among other health-related issues. It may be best to have a fresh nose come in and evaluate how well you're doing with respect to airflow and the overall air exchange in your calf rearing system. If your barn smells of ammonia, you'll need to work on your air exchange rates to optimize your calf health. There is a lot of extensive information out there, particularly from the conventional world, that does have a lot of application to the organic management system. See Dr. Jim Quigley, in particular Calf Note 149 on group housing and weaning strategies. It's really quite good. Bedding is a very important component of a calf management program. Warm, dry bedding facilitates nesting and grooming behaviors, two things that we really want to see in these young calves. Calves do grow better and stay healthier on deep, clean, dry bedding pecs as compared to slate or stone or concrete. Some beddings do confer some insulating capacity, and you really want that to help keep the calf warm. Wet bedding supports parasites, and it also induces a lot of sickness. Bedding is also specifically covered within the National Organic Program standards. The NOP states that the organic producer of 
livestock must establish and maintain livestock living conditions which accommodates the health and natural behavior of the animals, including appropriate, clean, dry bedding. So if the bedding is typically consumed by the animal, it must comply with the feed requirements. That means that if the animal can eat it, it has to be organically certified. For instance, straw is often used as a bedding material. Because the animal can eat it, it has to be organically certified. Likewise, this particular NOP guideline would also suggest that clean dry bedding must be used uh, in these kind of situations. So any type of calf rearing device or housing situation that's not compatible with bedding will not comply with the NOP standards. Let's talk about dehorning. Uh, the removal of horns in, in dairy cattle is a common practice to reduce the risk of injury and bruising of herd mates and, and certainly of farm workers as well. Cows with horns tend to use them when the spirit moves them and they have proven to be quite dangerous for intensive management purposes. The best way to dehorn calves is through genetic selection for the dominant polled allele that is responsible for the absence of horns in cattle. While it's possible to breed cattle without horns, the allele is fairly rare in the more popular dairy breeds. Even so, the prevalence of this dominant allele is becoming more and more common, particularly as animal welfare concerns take center stage and the number of polled sires, or sires that actually have the gene, become more popular. That polled allele is dominant in that it only requires one copy of the allele to create that polled phenotype thus making it easier to breed the polled condition into lines of cattle over successive generations. The challenge is to introduce the polled gene into the gene pool without losing the other important production traits like milk yield and components. The goal is to create superior lines of Holstein and Jerseys and, and others that excel in these traditional traits and yet transmit that polled gene at, with an allele frequency of 100%. So it just comes along with the entire package. Thus, it'll, that will eliminate the need for dehorning altogether. But until genetic dehorning becomes more prevalent, it's going to be necessary to remove horn buds from calves in the dairy industry for the near term. Because dehorning methods are, are painful, it's important to remove the horn buds as early as possible, before they become sizable and they become fully innervated, which means they can become full of nerve, nerve endings. The nerve endings become very well developed. Local analgesia or local anesthetics using products like lidocaine prior to dehorning can eliminate the acute pain for a few hours after the procedure. Lidocaine is approved for use in organic production and can be obtained from your local veterinarian. Alternatively, there are some herbal products that are also on the market and that have been shown to have some similar analgesic effects. Chemical dehorning methods such as caustic dehorning paste are definitely not allowed by the NOP. The most common method of dehorning is the electric hot iron dehorner. Topical or systemic analgesia is highly recommended for the pain. The technique does work well through three months of age. It is in fact bloodless. It's very fast and it can be used any time of year. You don't have to worry about blood and fly issues. You need to burn the horn bud tissue until it turns this copper brown color as indicated in the photo to the right. Usually takes about 10 to 15 seconds of application. The bud will tend to slough in about four to six weeks. And remember that caustic paste is just not allowed in organic production. Another type of dehorning is the scoop gouge or the Barnes type dehorner. These devices will remove the horn bud and the surrounding skin. Bleeding typically occurs. It's useful after the horn has already attached itself to the skull. So in those situations where dehorning hasn't taken place three months of age, by three months of age, this is a technique that can work. Uh, you need to observe for bleeding you know, for at least an hour after the procedure. And there certainly is a higher risk of blood and infection due to the open wound and clearly avoid fly season because you may end up with some fly strike issues associated with this technique. Dehorning can be a very painful procedure so 
efforts need to be taken to reduce that pain. One typical way to do that is through nerve blocking, um, using a lidocaine anesthetic. You can block the corneal nerve that innervates the horn. This nerve can be blocked with lidocaine injection. This would help make that dehorning procedure a little easier on the calf and on the person that performs the task. As an alternative to the lidocaine injectable analgesic, there are some oral herbal analgesic compounds on the market. These are administered sublingually, typically a couple of cc's under the tongue, given a few minutes prior to the dehorning procedure to get the effectiveness that you needed. In a field test that was conducted at the university farm, we contrasted serum cortisol levels following the dehorning procedure in calves that were treated with an herbal oral analgesic as compared to lidocaine injections and, and then a water placebo. And we found that the oral herbal analgesic was just as effective as lidocaine in the recovery rates of these calves and in serum cortisol levels uh, post dehorning. Vaccination programs are an important part of calf management. I consider the vaccine programs preventative medicine. It's my insurance policy against disease. How vaccines work is that it stimulates active immunity within the calf in that it stimulates the calf's own immune system to produce antibodies against those diseases. That immunity can last for months or years or even a lifetime, really depending upon the vaccine itself. Most vaccine manufacturers and veterinarians recommend annual boosters to, to basically remind the immune system about that particular antigen. It's just kind of a refresher course so that if a, an actual infection should occur, the immune system is ready to respond within hours. Typical vaccines that are utilized in calf programs include IBR or infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, BVD or bovine viral diarrhea, parainfluenza 3 virus, PI3, bovine syncytial virus, BRSV, clostridial type diseases, leptospirosis, brucellosis when the heifers are breeding age, and of course pink eye. So these are some of the vaccines that we utilize in our program, again, as a type of an insurance policy against disease. Vaccines are not infallible. Um, when vaccines fail, it's usually due to operator failure, and it, it includes some of these kinds of common mistakes. First and foremost is improper storage of the vaccine itself. Uh, if that vaccine is allowed to heat up or warm up, you basically deactivate it and it's no longer of any use. If you try to mix two vaccines together to speed things up in terms of administration, you can totally mess up uh, the vaccine response within the body. Those two vaccines the, or the adjuvants that they in may react and they bind one another up and it's like injecting water at that stage. Another mistake that could be made in the, the vaccination process is administering too low a dose or putting it in the wrong place. You know, perhaps it's a sub-Q vaccine and it's administered IM. Um, in, in either scenario, it's very important that you read the label and follow the label guidelines in terms of dose and route of administration. Inactivation of vaccines by residues is another way that you can make a vaccine fail. Using dirty syringes to pull the vaccine out of the bottle, you basically contaminate the rest of the bottle. And if you don't use it all in one day, that's going to incubate the bacteria. And as the bacteria incubate within the vaccine bottle, it'll deactivate your product. You can also have problems if you try to vaccinate an animal that's too young to respond to active immunization. Those are the animals that are still under the influence of passive immunization from the mother. So the mother will confer passive immunity or antibodies from her to her baby through the colostrum, typically. If those maternal antibodies are still circulating, they will interfere with the vaccine that you administer that uh, for active immunity. So you do need to make sure that you vaccinate animals at the appropriate age. 
If you vaccinate sick animals or stressed or unthrifty animals, um, the animal's immune system is not going to be in a position to respond. So again, the, that particular vaccine will be inactivated. Failure to administer a booster or waiting an extended period between boosters can also create problems because again, you're, you're trying to keep the immune system um, on call, always hoping that the immune system will be ready and willing to respond quickly should an actual infection occur. So if you fail to booster a vaccine on an annual basis, the immune system may forget what that antigen is. And by the same token, all killed vaccines need to have a booster um, when the animal sees that vaccine for the first time. If you do not give two successive injections at two to three weeks apart, you could create problems with uh, active immunity as well. Vaccination programs are essential to good health, but they really don't replace other important management practices like adequate colostrum intake, sound nutrition, proper sanitation. So realize that they're just one tool in that entire toolbox and they need to be appropriately applied. At this stage of the module, we're going to begin talking about common calf diseases and how to prevent them and how to treat them in an organic system. The diseases that we'll try to cover are typically the most common in calf management systems. Septicemia, scours or diarrhea, pneumonia, and parasites, both internal and external. Scours are one of the more common health problems affecting calves on any dairy. There are some estimates that would say 50% of calf deaths are due to scours at the early stages. However, good management can go a long way to reducing the number of cases every year and the severity of the disease. As always, if a farm has experienced an outbreak of scours, the question to ask is what's wrong with the management, not, not what should I use to treat it with. Some of the common causes, obvious uh, virus, bacteria, protozoa, there are many, and it basically impairs the ability of the intestine to reabsorb fluids and electrolytes. We see a decrease in the absorption of nutrients. Um, you basically have this flushing of the intestine trying to rid the infectious agent from the system. Potential breaks in your management that may have caused the scour outbreak, uh, clearly environmental issues that affect the calf directly, housing, colostrum management um, that's, that's not adequate, uh, poor sanitation, bad ventilation, stressed calf population, bad nutrition, nutrition that isn't meeting the, the needs of the calf, or a group housing scenario that um, allows the, the calf scour um, organisms to um, spread from one calf to the next. All of these situations you know, could represent potential breaks in your management that would allow um, an outbreak of scours to occur. The symptoms of scours are pretty easy to recognize. You know, clearly the back half of the calf is pretty obvious. Looking at the manure of the calf is going to tell you everything. But typically if the calf appears normal with less than a 5 to 6 percent um, dehydration rate, you know, you're still in a really good zone to, to change the situation and get that calf back on track. Once the dehydration exceeds 6 percent, you'll see that the calf is going downhill. They'll lose weight, they'll lose their appetite, they are depressed you uh, develop um, dry oral mucous membranes, the eyes begin to sink into the head, and there's decreased skin elasticity if you look at that. So that's when that calf is in serious trouble and you do need to hydrate lots and lots of electrolyte based fluids to that calf. Once the dehydration exceeds 10 to 12 percent, you know, you begin to see uh, organs shut down. The extremities start to get cold, the calf is recumbent, and its death is soon to follow. At that point in time, it's very difficult to resurrect that calf. Scours prevention is, is always the best policy. And here are some ways that you can actually prevent scours from ever entering your calf herd. Maintain the health and the body condition of the cow prior to calving. That dry cow period is really critical, not only to her subsequent lactation, but also for the health of the calf that she's giving birth to. 
after birth, move that calf to a nice, clean, and very dry environment. And that calf should be able to thermoregulate very, very quickly in this, this new home. Provide lots of high-quality colostrum so that the calf can build a natural resistance from the acquired immunity that it, it's gaining from the mother's um, immune system. Isolate any infected calves that could actually cause severe infection. So make sure that you isolate anything that looks questionable so that the rest of the calves are not exposed. Then also prevent nutritional scours. Um, you can decrease the incidence of nutritional scours by maintaining a proper feeding schedule and not allowing those calves to gorge themselves at a very at one large feeding. Space it out over the course of the day. Two feedings is, is usually fairly good to prevent nutritional scours from occurring. And also ensure that that milk that you're feeding is not overheated because those denatured proteins could also induce a nutritional type of scours. In the face of a scour outbreak, or if you do have a calf that has scours, the, the best thing to do is to apply oral electrolytes. Dehydration is the number one reason why calves with scours die. Electrolyte solutions are available commercially or you can make them up at home. Provide them at the first sign of scours. If the calf can drink, then electrolytes can be fed in a bucket or in a bottle. If the calf won't drink, you do need to administer the electrolytes with an esophageal feeder. Feed one pint per 10 pounds of body weight, and you need to administer it three to four times a day between the milk feedings. It's very important that you don't withhold milk in a scouring calf. But by the same token, you don't want to mix the electrolyte water solution into your milk and then feed the calf. That's only going to prevent the milk from curdling in the stomach and the calf is going to not obtain all the nutrition. As a matter of fact, it's just going to move it right through the system and worsen the scour scenario. So feed the um, milk feedings and then in between milk feedings, apply the electrolytes. That's the best method. Probiotics, these are great products that contain a lot of good bacteria like lactobacillus and they compete with the scours bacteria in the gut. They can be fed preventatively or they can be fed as part of a, a treatment regime for scouring calves. But, you know, make sure that you get these products approved by your certifier. And they make sure that they're non-GMO and that all the ingredients are actually allowed. Mana oligosaccharides are another approach that could also be utilized in, in a scouring calf. These are complex sugars that come from the yeast cell wall. Bad bacteria like E. coli like to bind to these yeast sugars and then they travel through the intestinal tract and then out into the manure. Because the bad bacteria are bound to the mana oligosaccharides, they can attach to the gut wall and further cause disease. So these products can be fed preventatively or they can be part of a treatment regime as well. Another effective uh, treatment is Immunoboost, where there's a variety of different products out there that actually stimulate the immune system so that the immune system can clean up the infection. Passive antibodies. If you happen to know what infectious organism you're working with, you can purchase a passive antibody to that and administer it. It works the same way as colostrum. Um, alternative ther therapies, there are many, but um, you know these you know may not be scientifically evaluated or appropriate for all farms. So this is really up to the individual producer and the consulting veterinarian that's working with each each farm. Um, there's a variety of different types of herbs that have been used uh, to treat scours, homeopathy, um, organic yogurt. For, um, actually serves as a uh, probiotic. Um, lots of different alternative therapies that uh, I won't necessarily go into here. This table lists several of the causative organisms of scours in calves along with uh, the typical ages with which they're affected, some of the common symptoms, methods of diagnosis, and then some general comments with respect to each one of these organisms. Typically, the agent can be determined by fecal culture, having cultures taken of the diarrhea itself, or taking a manure sample and having a fecal flotation done to determine if it's actually some type of, of parasites, like cryptosporidium or coccidiosis. In either case, that will help you affirm the type of infection and then will help you develop a strategy to prevent this in the future.
Internal parasites is a, another area that needs specific attention in organic calf management practices. These uh, calves are the most vulnerable to internal parasites as uh, they have the most immature immune system. Special care needs to be taken when we manage these calves organically to control internal parasites. Coccidia are um, one example of an internal parasite that really needs special attention in organic dairy production. It's, uh, coccidia is a one-cell intracellular parasite, has a very narrow host range in that the type of coccidia that infects poultry is going to be different than that that infects cattle. They, it, it has a fecal oral transmission route, so it's from contaminated fecal material that gets ingested by the animal. That's how the uh, infection continues to reoccur. It's usually worst in confined livestock where they come in contact with contaminated feces or contaminated feeding areas um, more often and more frequently. Here is some examples of, of what we mean by contaminated feed areas and contaminated um, waterers. And these calves are so closely confined, naturally if one calf has the coccidia, they all will have coccidia as they continue to exchange um, manure and saliva on a regular basis. There are a number of internal parasites to be aware of. They affect the various organs. Roundworms tend to be the most economically important parasite in terms of their prevalence and the damage that they do um, at the infective stage. All internal parasites have the same basic life cycle. They shed eggs into the feces. The feces is deposited then into the environment, typically out on pasture in an organic system. The eggs mature into an infective larvae. That larvae then becomes ingested during the grazing process because these larvae will be available in these droplets, water droplets, on the blades of grass. They then develop into adults in three weeks to a month in that neighborhood and begin uh, producing eggs themselves. So you can see the cycle um, reinvents itself on a regular basis if it's allowed to and if, if the system is not managed. This is a photograph that basically shows some very short feed where the animals and livestock have been allowed to graze the forages right down to the ground. This is a great way to, well, damage the pasture, but also it's another way to ensure that you're going to reinfect your livestock. Because when the grass is grazed that tightly, then it only ensures that all of the larvae that happens to be on that forage is going to be ingested by the livestock. Here are some creative approaches to trying to break the uh, parasite cycle by not allowing the animals to remain on any contaminated areas, or nor are you allowing the animal to graze the, the ground or the forages too tightly. Here you have some photos of um, a clean pasture ground being utilized by the calves. You can see it's fresh. Here a group of calves is being moved around in a makeshift pen. Um, the same scenario here where the entire pen is being moved to a new clean location. All of these strategies will help reduce the incidence of reinfestation of, of parasites. Septicemia is another common calf disease. Calves with septicemia will become very weak and depressed. They go into a type of toxic shock and they can die pretty quickly within 12 hours of showing any clinical signs. The disease-producing bacteria actually get into the bloodstream of the calf, and, and typically it's, it's due to um, an, you know, an infected navel or a damaged intestinal wall. In either case, it's a pretty difficult thing to treat and very expensive. Uh, survival rates tend to be very low. Early on in the disease, the calf just appears weak and depressed, as I indicated earlier. The navel may be tender if that was the route of infection. Later on, the disease develops into swollen joints and pneumonia, diarrhea, etc. It's really problematic. The best thing to do is to prevent it from happening at all. And the way in which to prevent septicemia is to keep the calves in a very clean and dry environment, minimizing the exposure to any pathogens. Calves that have had adequate colostrum and really good passive transfer of immunity will be at less risk for developing septicemia. In fact, most septicemia calves have been um, become infected and become ill because they have had inadequate amounts of colostrum. 
Pneumonia is another common disease in calves. It's an infection that inflames and damages the lungs. Symptoms include an elevated temperature, high respiration rate, and a reduced feed intake, and overall just a general malaise about the calf. Preventing pneumonia is really the best approach. Here are some ideas to look at in terms of developing a program that will prevent pneumonia in your calves. First and foremost, adequate nutrition. You've got to have proper nutrition in order to keep those calves strong so that their immune systems can fight off disease. Secondarily, it's passive antibody transfer. It's making sure that the calf has adequate amounts of colostrum at the time of birth. Within the first 24 hours, it needs to have at least four quarts of really high quality colostrum. The management of the calf does play a, a big role in determining the level of bacteria and viruses that, that can come in contact with the calf and cause pneumonia. You need to check for drafts in the housing conditions, uh, the bedding, the ventilation, is it overcrowded? All of those considerations are going to impact uh, the calf's stress load and his ability to uh, withstand an infection. And finally, vaccines. They're a great way to prevent some respiratory type disease. It's basically your insurance policy against um, respiratory infection. Here are some common respiratory type diseases the infectious agents that cause the disease, symptoms, and some management comments that go along with each one. At the top of the list is BRSV, IBR, and parainfluenza type 3. Then we follow up with Pasteurella, Haemophilus, and Mycoplasma, and, and frankly the Pasteurella, Haemophilus, and Mycoplasma can actually be part of uh, the respiratory tract of normal healthy animals. It's only when the immune system is compromised then that these normal flora can actually become pathogenic. There's also the aspiration pneumonia, which is caused by a poor technique with an esophageal feeder or careless drenching where you're able to get fluids into the lung tissue, and this is really devastating for the calf. So how do we treat respiratory problems in organic calves? Well, we need to begin by fixing those problems that caused the infection to begin with. You know, if you've got some drabs or ventilation issues, you need to address those problems. If the bedding and the housing situation is not warm and dry, you'll need to fix that as well. Also consider vaccinating the calves early on in the outbreak with an intranasal vaccine. That's a, a type of situation where the vaccine stimulates a local immunity and the animal is better able to withstand the disease, so you lessen the severity of the symptoms and you also speed recovery. Additionally, you can use um, passive antib antibodies uh, for Pasteurella. You might want to consider Immunoboost to try and support the immune system. Both vitamin A and C injections are also very good to support the immune system and speed recovery. Administering anti-inflammatories like aspirin to reduce fever and to prevent lung damage, perfectly acceptable in an organic system plan. And finally, you need to consider antibiotics. So in the case where the calf is just not responding to any of the other treatments that uh, are suitable for organic, then you must use antibiotics to prevent the animal from suffering. Animals that are treated with antibiotics must be removed from the organic production system, so they will no longer be able to um, produce organic products in any way. Alternative therapies, well, these are not scientifically evaluated, um, and they may not be appropriate for all farms. You might want to consult with your veterinarian or with your other healthcare professional to get an idea of what kinds of products might work um, on respiratory type infections. Some of these products would include herbal antibiotic tinctures, garlic, homeopathy, and essential oils. In particular, eucalyptus has been used for respiratory type treatments. Additional information is available from a variety of sources, and here are a few good pieces of, of information that I found very helpful when it came to putting together this particular module. I certainly have enjoyed this module on organic calf management, and I hope you have too. And I look forward to uh, talking to you at length. If you have any particular questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Two additional pieces of reference material that I'll recommend. 
The Alternative Treatment for Ruminant Animals by Dr. Paul Detloff. It's a safe, natural veterinary care for cattle, sheep, and goats. And also the new Barn Guide by Dr. Hugh Carriman, Treating Dairy Cows Naturally, the practical guide for, for cow care for farmers. There's some great photos in that particular book, um, along with some great guidance information.